do is to acknowledge the really important um, value that's placed on uh, hearing about uh, the lived experience in this area. And so it's really uh, wonderful to work once again uh, with Arani Sant in this way. So Arani's here today uh, to actually help us understand how this matters. Arani is a carer to her son and carer representative of Carers New South Wales and a member of the NBIA National Mental Health Sector Reference Group. So she knows her stuff in this territory and has put her first-hand knowledge to great use. She's an advisor to Better Caring, a digital startup company where care and support workers can be hired directly. And Arani is going to share her um, personal experience today uh, and how it's relevant. So thank you, Arani. disease refers to disease of the heart and blood vessels, 
and includes things like stroke and heart attack. So even though lots of people in the general population also get cardiovascular disease, there are different factors that make people with an intellectual disability more likely to develop cardiovascular disease compared to the general population. And these are called risk factors. Some of those, are, obviously, Julian just spoke about in his speech. So some, some statistics, and this is taken from Australian data, 69% uh, of adults with a severe or profound disability are overweight or obese, compared to 58% of adults without a disability. In the school age population, children with an intellectual disability, 15% uh, of school children uh, are obese, compared to only 6% of school children without an intellectual disability. So that's indicating that often these problems start at a very young age. We, we also saw from Julian speaking about that low level or no exercise. So 43% of people with a disability age 15 to 64 do little or no exercise versus 31% for those in the general population. Smoking, one of the biggest risk factors. 31% uh, of people with a disability in the population group um, smoke versus 18% of people in, without a disability. So these risk factors, um, one of the biggest risk factors affecting uh, the people that we're talking about, and in particular people with autism, is being prescribed medications for mental health problems. And so comorbidity, <coughs> intellectual disability uh, with mental health, mental illness. So recent studies of autism in the UK have shown that 70% 70, 70 of people on the spectrum could be diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. And other studies show that 50% of adults with autism will develop mental health issues. One in 100 people in Australia have autism, and every working hour another Australian child is diagnosed with autism. We also know that the risk of developing mental illness is increased for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As uh, Scott mentioned earlier, 400,000 Australians have an intellectual disability, and at any one time, an estimated 40% of those people will also have a mental health disorder. So why is this all important? Why, why as, as we can see, it's important because being prescribed medications for mental health problems is one of those things that increases the risk of cardiometabolic diseases. So I've been invited here today to share with you a part of our journey and it is indeed an honour after seeing the presentation about the, the toolkit and the framework and the resources that have been developed. Um, I really feel that this work is so important um, you know, in, in in educating professionals and carers and, and, and the community generally. So talking about our story, where are we up to? So our journey. Uh, so my son had always exhibited obsessive topic fixation and anxiety due to his autism. But at the age of 18, this became markedly worse and he developed an initial psychotic episode. He was unwell for some time, but has managed his anxiety du during his recovery to wellness with a low-level dose of psychotropic medication. I do worry continually, every day, about the side effects of this medication. He had initially a quite large weight gain, but that has stabilised now and uh, he's probably thinner than I am. <laughs> we often have a competition about that. <laughs> so to maintain his health, we do the following. Obviously visits to his own GP. It's a doctor that's known uh, to us and to him when he's sick, plus an annual health check, which in fact we were just there like two months ago, three months ago. Um, this GP knows his medical history and checks in regularly with his psychiatrist as well. 
My son knows the importance of a good diet and not overeating. He has seen a dietitian and knows the risks associated with being obese. My son loves sport and he has in fact tried 14 different sports. He has an exercise program including a personal trainer once a week, plus walking and golf. He also played basketball previously, uh, not, not for the last few months. Uh, he has not seen an exercise physician, I think that's what's called, but he did have intervention from an occupational therapist for six months in 2010 and 11 when he first uh, uh, was got sick. Uh, I really feel that it's important to set goals and we are, for example, and the, the goal, uh, Shay and I are leading the Better Caring team in the city to surf soon and we need to get fit in order to do that. We're not running, we're, we're just walking. Uh, and Shay wants to compete nationally in golf tournaments, uh, which is another goal to, to work towards. And, you know, people think that golf... You know, it's just walking around, but it does require also a high uh, a level of fitness. Uh, Shay takes multivitamins, uh, vitamin D supplement, and fish oil tablets. Very importantly for his mental health, uh, he sees a, a psychologist every two weeks, and his psychiatrist every three months, and he checks uh, uh, in with them on how he is doing. Uh, I try to set a good example to my son and have also consulted and been treated by psychologists in the past to help me cope with my role of being a carer. But, you know, above all else and above all things, and I think this has been touched on, but uh, having a full and inclusive life is, is really one of the most important things to being happy. Um, and being happy is linked to good health. Uh, for Shay, having a creative, productive outlet as an artist is key to this. And I've included his paintings uh, in the PowerPoint today, uh, which he only became an artist uh, in 2000, since 2010, uh, and it was part of his recovery. He attends, he attends still uh, urban art space in Double Bay for developing his art practice. So some of the recommendations are, from my point of view as a carer and, and a pretty active carer the last six years in this uh, mental health, intellectual disability area, uh, and it's been a pretty exciting six years, So and a lot of good things and a lot of uh, great changes. But I, I do think uh, some things that could be implemented that would help other people uh, with intellectual disability uh, for example, uh, general practitioners, psychiatrists and allied health professionals should work together and develop a general health plan or a mental health plan for those people most at risk. I think this should include six monthly reviews and reminders to patients that a health, health checkup is due. This is done by my local dental practice, for example. I get these letters every six months that are due to go to the dentist. I also receive timely reminders from the government for a pap smear, and I also got those things for the bowel cancer test, and I think men get other things. So, yeah, so there's ways to, to prompt and remind, and, you know, especially with the, the e-health uh, system, you know, where we can put everything, I don't think it's working so well, but... Uh, so, there should be also greater use of the community nurse, and I really feel that that's... Uh, a really key part to to uh, helping uh, people uh, in many many ways in the community, uh, and also the nurse practitioner in the general practice, I think could be part of this reminder and, and review system uh, for people with an intellectual disability and or autism spectrum disorders. Australia's investment in the NDIS will lead to better life outcomes for people with a disability. However, the government should not overlook investment in programs that improve the health, social and economic prospects for people with an intellectual disability. This investment should improve their equal access in the community. 
and lead to better general and cardiometabolic health. So, in conclusion of my short presentation, people with an intellectual disability have very poor health compared to other people in the general population. And cardiometabolic disease is among the leading cause of death among this group. We can reduce the chance of people with an intellectual disability developing cardiometabolic disease by reducing the risk factors that make the disease likely. It is crucial that medical practitioners look after the physical health as well as the mental well-being of people with an ID with intellectual disability, sorry. By using the new early intervention framework and resources for people with an intellectual disability, health professionals will and can improve the cardiometabolic health and quality of life of their patients. It is really important that family carers and care workers understand the risk factors for metabolic syndrome and cardiometabolic disease. My knowledge has certainly increased by preparing this talk today. And I think uh, these, these postcards are a much needed and a fantastic resource and I hope that they will be widely distributed among, among the community. So thank you Professor Troller and the team for developing this early intervention framework and thank you for this opportunity to share our story.